Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's In Conversation with our guest, Tony Adams, NBE. Uh, my name is Professor Henrietta Bowden-Jones. I'm uh, President of Psychiatry here at the Royal Society of Medicine. And before I introduce Tony, uh, I would very much like to remind you all that the Q&A function makes this evening um, whatever you want to make of it. We love having your questions. They can be as varied as you would like. And just, I will make time to ask him everything. I've already had questions being emailed to me, so we know that uh, people want to know about him. Uh, now, uh, having said this, the other thing I'd like to say is if, if this conversation, which will be about football, but also about mental health things and uh, addiction things, if any of you are uh, in some way troubled by what you hear, you're very welcome to send an email uh, to the, uh, if you look in the chat, there is an email there for you to write to, and I will make sure that I signpost you to the right sort of help. Um, that's just a sort of warning. Okay, uh, but anyway, let's bring Tony onto the picture here, and I will now read out his biography. Hi, Tony, welcome to tonight, uh, tonight's interview. All right, Tony Adams, MB, the most successful Arsenal football club captain of all time ex-England captain and the only player in English football history to have captained a title-winning team in three different decades. Uh, remarkable. He's included in the Football League 100 legends. He has a statue of him at the Emirates Stadium, unveiled in 2011. He played in the Euro 88, 96 and 2000, as well as in the 1998 World Cup Finals. We're going to hear about this. <laughs> he holds the Wembley record appearance 59 times. And he was the last England player to score at the old Wembley Stadium against Ukraine in 2000. He was awarded an MB for services to football. And in 2000, he founded Sporting Chance Clinic, an incredible charity that provides treatment and support for current and past uh, and former professional sports people experiencing harm from alcohol, drugs, or gambling. And more recently, he founded the Six Mental Health Solutions. So it's a real pleasure to have you here, uh, Tony. And before we uh, start with lots of questions, uh, let, I was just trying to remember, because I've known you for so oh. many years, when it first happened. And I, I remember being, this is like 15 years ago, one weekend, uh, at the end of the weekend, I had the Financial Times in my hand. It was very late at night, maybe, I don't know, midnight. And I was thinking, I really need to finish reading the paper. And I read uh, this story about this football player, and I'm not a football fan, sorry to say, but I read your story. And as an addiction psychiatrist as I was, I was brought to tears by it. And I thought, this man, I need to give him, so I want to help him, you know, I want to give him my support. And I still remember sending an email to the Sporting Charles Clinic and then forgetting about it. Well, in the morning, your CEO, Peter Kay, the iconic chef who was the best CEO ever, um, had replied going, Henrietta, uh, we've organised for a car to pick you up on Thursday. And, and before I knew it, I was on my way to Liphook, to the centre. And it was at this point that I realised, oh, my goodness, was I being too impulsive? You know, what's waiting for me down there? I'm being taken out of London by people I don't know. Um, but the good news is I was a trustee for 10 years and, and, you know, professionally that changed my life just as much as Sporting Chance changes and has done save people's lives uh, forevermore since you started it. So on that wonderful note, let's let, let's get going. Um, the obvious question to start with is when did you become aware of your potential in relation to football? Um, when was it? Oh, well, first and foremost, that's a thank you for the introduction. You know, I, I can listen to that all day, just talking. <laughs> I've forgotten what I'd achieved. That's really good to be reminded. Um, yeah, thank you very much. And yeah, we've had a special relationship for a long time now. And, you know, my heart, you know, I can't thank you enough for the 10 years service to my charity. 
And uh, it's one of the reasons why it is 21 years old now and thriving. And we maybe cover that a bit later on. But to answer your question, yeah, my dad was a footballer. Um, he thought he was better than me, actually. He played British Army um, and came out. And I was just, um, I remember my first, I was six years old over Hackney Marshes, this this. Um, renowned um, uh, football pitches uh, that uh, actually they've, they've reduced in size since the Olympic Park was built. But the Hackney Parshes, you've got regular football over there from oh centuries. And uh, um, I was, it was a wet day and uh, I was six, five years old and I'm just sitting there on the side watching my father. He was a central defender and I was sold. I was absolutely sold. It was what I wanted to be from that from that very moment. I said, wow, you know, I want to be like my dad. So that's how it happened. How beautiful. That's a lovely, lovely story. And and was he, were your parents supportive of this choice? And were they aware that that's really what you had set your mind towards? To be honest with you, that's all, all I could do. And they, and they, it, it kind of took over their life as well. It, it, I don't know about, our, um, and it still does today. A lot of young kids, you know, they, they ended up to be my taxi football. You know, I was training Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you know, two games at weekends. It takes a hell of, uh, a lot of uh, time and energy. And I, I don't think that I've got that for my kids now. Dude. I've got six children and stuff. And I don't think they, they were so committed and so great for me. You know, they, they knew from the very start that I wanted to be a player. And uh, I took it very, very serious from the start. And to be honest with you, it was the only place I really felt comfortable, you know, because I'm personally away from the pitch. I was, I felt, um, you know, I had no tools at all, to be honest with you. I felt self-conscious. I felt ugly. I had a big nose. I've still got a big nose. but <laughs> I just felt so um, worthless. You know, it was a real... Um, uh, Jekyll and Hyde scenario where I off the football pitch in the classroom panic attacks sensitive around girls and you couldn't just it frightened I was bullied and I became a bullier you know all these issues at school but on the football pitch completely different person confident Tony TA's up smashing balls hitting balls making tackle completely chalk and cheese character you know, which kind of reverberated through my, my whole yeah, life. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm accelerating. Another question, Ed. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, I can just see you there. I can completely understand what you're saying. It gave you the confidence uh, that you so needed. And I love the idea that your parents supported you. And, and five times a week, what, what did the teacher, tell me about the teachers, were they... Uh, also aware of your aspirations? Were they forgiving for your time uh, practicing? Yeah, I had the worst attendance of my school. I wasn't proud of that. I just couldn't do school. You know, I remember the book going around the classroom and uh, sitting there, and I know now having a panic attack, but, I, I, you know, my language, I was just shitting myself. It was going round, and I'm like, oh, and because... I'm in such a mess. When the book comes to me, I said really instead of really. And everybody laughed. And the sensitivity that I was then, I was so I was like, oh my God, I can't handle this. So I put a mask on. I said, Tony's the footballer, you know. And I only went to school when there was footballers. You know, Mr. Beach, my English teacher, used to say to me, Oh, we must have football today. Tony's in the classroom. So yeah. I was getting all my self-esteem at her for what I was through football and not through who I was. Yeah. So yeah. I had problems later on in my life when football ended and you're left with yourself, you know, and Absolutely. then you've got nothing else, then, yeah. then you really are struggling. But at school, you know, I, I, I couldn't wait to get out and onto the football pitch. It wasn't yeah. for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we'll get on to that, of course, what happens, you know, what happened then, of course, and, 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 and whether people are, are more geared up now for ending their careers as professional players. Uh, so what would... Any thought, would you have been anything else if football hadn't been your thing? I, can you envisage another life that you would have lived well? Because I say you've had a life well lived if, and uh, you yeah. know, that, that's really what you've done. You've achieved so much in different spheres. Yeah, I, I was, um, I had a little bit of talent and uh, I, I was very driven um, and uh, supported by my parents and Got a little bit of luck along the journey and, and football. I'm here today because I kicked the ball about when I was six years old. You know, that, that in a nutshell, it's 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 my life. It's been my life for, for so long. So 
Um, you know, one kind of school would tell you what kind of how I was because it uh, at that period. I always remember a, a girl when I was fifteen, and um, I've got a, I was doing a hundred headers on my head, one, two, three, four, five, six, because I was completely set, obsessed with the game, you know, and completely obsessed. And uh, Catherine Ox, she's going to be on the call one day. <laughs> Catherine Ox walks past, and she says to me, uh, "I want to go out with you." So I put the ball down. We walk around the block. She, we kind of kiss on the corner. I did something, and then she said, "Oh, I don't want to go out with you anymore." And I was like, "Ah!" So what I did. Any thought or feeling, get the ball, put it yeah. on my head, and yeah. I was away yeah. again. I didn't wow. have to think. Yeah. Didn't have to think, Etta, and I didn't have to feel. You know, I escaped. Can you, can you still do that with a hundred? Can you do that a hundred times? I've never seen you do that. Are you? Can, are you still uh, really, I've still got it. I've still got ah. it in there. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> next time we meet. Next I've time you meet. I've made a career out of heading the ball. I fully expect you to do that a hundred times. Now, I, there are an enormous number of questions in the chat, which I will start asking pretty soon because it shows how engaged the audience is. But, but you know, I've got a few questions. How, you know, you were captain of England. I can't get that out of my head. And it's really, you know, now that I was preparing for this interview that I fully comprehend what it, you know, the enormity of what you did. So, what I want to know is, uh, first of all, is it something that you think about every day? Like if someone's captained England, is that now inherently part of your identity to the point where you wake up and you go, I captained England, I'll get up and have a cup of tea, you know, is it like that? Uh, no, it's, of course it's not. Uh, you know, I'd be full of self and uh, an ego. And uh, no, it doesn't define me. My past doesn't define me. I've, I've been retired now since 2002. It's 19 years. And, uh, you know, we're going to come on to it. I think about my sporting chance, charity, yeah. helps, you know, saving lives and helping life transcends. You know, I played for Arsenal. I was the most successful captain, as you said, of all time. But there's nothing like leading your country out at home in the Euros 25 years ago now, and we're just going into another tournament. Uh, it's that time of year. And I was so proud, this proud Englishman to actually leave my country. So in them, in them kind of calm moments, I do occasionally, because I, I never used to, but I do pat myself on the back and say, yeah. you, you, you yeah. did all right. And I was clean because I had six years clean and sober before I packed up the game. A lot of people, a lot of um, addicts, don't uh, they get their issues when they've retired but I actually got them it accelerated my illness for me you know being I had rejection from my first wife and, and and a few other things I got injured had a bad injury and so it escalated the illness and um, so I got it really uh, and I was able to be more successful than I ever was, which is really important to say. You know, I won two doubles in, in 98 and 2002 because I don't go by this losing your mojo job, you know, when you're, when you're not drinking or you're, not, you're gambling or drunk and drinking or, 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 or drugging. You know, I think for me, I fulfill myself as a player and I fulfill myself as a human being. And, uh, you know, but I do now and again pat myself on the back because mm -hmm. I, I did play for my country <laughs> and I had a great career. You led, you but led your country. Important. Anything. There's yeah. nothing like saving lives, you know. Yeah, so, yeah I understand really how it would have superseded this. So, so that the intensity of the emotion as you were get walking onto the, then I'll move on to you know very important topics. But for a moment, let me stay with this because I'm a truly fascinated by it. So, it, how, what what words would you use about you're walking onto this? pitch and you are going to be playing for your country what do you have any thoughts in there or is it just like you're just focusing on the game uh, you know I, I said earlier it, it was the one place that I felt comfortable yeah you yeah. know walking into a, a room full of doing a conversation I couldn't open my mouth for 29 years I couldn't open my mouth mm -hmm. now they can't shut me up so we might have to <laughs> run out of time off. but I, I've had I've got the ability now to open up my mouth and to share, tell you how I I think and feel when I, I didn't have that ability so going in and you know reading a book in a classroom couldn't do it walking onto a pitch you know 100,000 people easy absolutely easy, easy, I, I, I easy. Do it with yeah. golf now Retta, you know I'm, I'm, a, I'm a shivering wreck when I've got yeah. a putt for about that yeah. bit I'm like oh because I'm no I'm no good at yeah. it so it was a skill you knew you had the skill so one tell us in a few words 
the pressures of playing at that level, looking back, what were the greatest, ple uh, not pleasures, but pressures, and where did they come from? Was it, who, who was causing that pressure? Before, before I've, I've got kind of two careers, you know, a sober career and, and a drinking career, and pre-96, um, I very much was, um, I, all my pressures were coming externally, you know, off the pitch, and uh, I had so much pressures off the pitch that actually the football was my release. But I've got to tell you, when I clean, got clean and sober and I went onto the football pitch, first and foremost, physically, uh, it was far much easier. I'm not consuming the amount of alcohol that I was consuming. So that was very easy. I didn't used to break sweat. You know, it was so easy for me to gain. But more importantly, emotionally and mentally, I was on fire. You yeah. know, there was I felt invincible, you know, and I, I've got a very famous goal and a very famous statue uh, at the Arsenal. Uh, I ran through the middle clean and so I was 18 months without a drink or a bet or, or, or a drug and uh, I smashed one in with my left foot and uh, I, I wheeled off and it's a very, very um, spiritual moment for me. You know, I was at one, my emotions, my my mental state, I was just absolutely free as a bird. I've, yeah, ne I've yeah. never been like that. Oh, wow. Probably about three times in my life, you yeah. know, um, yeah. that I've, that I've uh, experienced those those orgasmic kind of moments. Yeah, and, and yeah. That was very cool. powerful, very, very powerful uh, to hear you speak in this way. Now, uh, for, for, for some of some people, I know there are some ex-professional players actually tonight are listening to you, quite, quite a few, um, but can you tell the, the rest of us what it means to be football league, to be inducted into the Football League 100 legends? What does it mean exactly? Yeah, I, I think, you know, my football were, um, my football were um, trophies, that, and there's many, and my honours, you know, uh, my services to football. I, I speak from, well, just talking about being humble and, and be, you're not really, <laughs> when, you, when you're talking about humility, <laughs> you know, it's soon it goes out the door straight away. But I do tend to feel that I, that I was given a lot of um, gifts and a lot of tools, a lot of skills, and I worked really hard and... Um, and uh, I had a lovely career and, and did everything like World Cups uh, in, in, and all the kind of trimmings come with that. You know, the, the inductions and all the stuff that you know, the services to football, you know, I just did it like I do my not drinking at a day at a time. I just put one foot in front of the front of the other and did the next right thing, you know, and the next loving thing and just showed up. You yeah. know, showed up, put one foot in front of the other, practiced day at a time and things got better and my career got better and my life got better. You know, just practicing small little things a day at a time, you know, daily routines about structure. You know, part of the word spiritual, we've got ritual in there. You know, and I think it's very important for us to have structures around our day. You know, I go for walks, I meditate, you know, I, I play golf. You know, there's a lot of things that I do in my day on a, on a day and I open my mouth and I talk and I come and share my stuff with you. Beautiful. Now, you retired from professional football in 2002 after 19 years of playing, if I'm correct. Um, uh, how has the game changed um, in relation to when you first started? What are the most remarkable differences being a player now? Oh, it's a, I, I started in, um, I signed Arsenal schoolboys in 1979 as a 13-year-old and I made me debut in 83, went through to 2002. And when I started the game, I broke my nose five times in the first year of my career. It was a very physical game. There was a lot of contact allowed and the game changed physically from, from one extreme to the other. Now, if you're talking about off the pitch and, and the culture, when I was... When I was playing, there was a very a big drinking culture. You know, we drunk heavily after matches um, midweek. You know, if we had a day off on a Wednesday, we'd, we'd pretty much get smashed. I pretty much got smashed. A few of the lads just went home. You know, I noticed later on <laughs> when I did sober up that not everybody drunk like me. <laughs> you know, a lot of people went home to their families and stuff. But there was a very heavy culture of drinking now the education and sporting chances got something to do with this as well in the last 21 years has gone through the roof you know we've we've year on year give the the premier league club starting at eight years old now education 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 and it started to seep through you know and and you're getting quite you know there's 
minorities that are, are still having their issues and the drug of choice is kind of changed from from uh, drinking to gambling because the physical levels alcohol you can't keep up with the physical levels of professional footballers so they're, they're gaming they're gambling this kind of stuff is more prevalent uh, uh, dominant in the in the in the premier league certainly in the top divisions lower league it's a, still a little bit of booze um recreational weekends and stuff a bit of drug, drugs and stuff but um i don't know where i was going with that but ah, uh, yeah well, well well i mean i think you've That's pretty much you pretty much told us you know <laughs> so so that the so players are, are far more protected and there's more preventative work and uh, and certainly you know that through the sporting chance world that's what what i what i've noticed in the last decade tony i i we have the greatest numbers of questions now so i'm going to take a <laughs> bit of time before i continue with you know with the story really and get on to sporting chance etc i'm going to ask you some of the things in this chat um we've got andy may uh, very keen to know. Uh, let me just move my little thing across so I can read everything. Um, uh, saying, as an ex-professional footballer with addiction issues during your career, how does it make you feel nowadays when you watch a match on TV or in a stadium and you see floods of gambling-related advertising swamping the game? Um, if the decision was down to you, what would you like to see changed about it? I promise the audience I did not plant this. <laughs> I do not know, Andy May, but it's coming up now as a top question. <laughs> Well, you know, my stance, I'm the same with alcohol, you know, I, I'm not anti-gambling, I'm not anti-drugging, I'm very pro-athlete asking for help, or like me, when when you've got an issue, reach out, go and get the help, that's what I'm very pro, you know, for the majority of the, the, the population who can take it or leave it, go and knock yourself out, you know, but for me, yeah, it doesn't help, let's, let's be honest, you know, there is... You know, if I'm looking at that, it does, you know, if I'm getting, we're like sponges, aren't we? You know, and if if we constantly, the messaging services come in, gamble here, gamble there, gamble game, you know, it, it's good, it's inevitable for you to, to to access it for me, you know, it's like, but and there's a, there's a group of uh, people in this, the population that will cross the line like I did they cross the line and they won't be able to get back yeah. so you know I'd, I'd love it a warning kind of on it, all of it we've got the we've got the the slogans that they say you know when the fun stops stop I don't think it was ever fun for me to be honest with you but when the fun stops but I want to go one further with that and if you can't stop reach out for help yeah, yeah very, wanna, very good point. I want yeah. to go one further, you know. Yeah, 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 absolutely. It's possible, you know, because actually, uh, as you suggest, plenty of people would think it's up to me to stop, uh, but wouldn't necessarily reach out. Now, we've got Andrew Hughes with large sums of money involved. Uh, sorry, he's disappeared. Here we are. With the large sums of money involved for young professional footballers, uh, do you think this increases the mental pressure? on today's players compared to the 80s or 90s oh absolutely it comes with a certain amount of responsibility you give i don't know if you give me that amount of money when i'm a 21 year old i, I think i'd be dead you, 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 it's a, you know you, you the, the sums of money that they're throwing uh, at kids today you know uh, young 20 21 year olds yeah. I'm all in favour of giving it to them, but I think they should give it at their end of their contract. So, so what are they giving? Give us an idea. I have I, I think no idea. idea. Is it what, what? What is it? Hundreds of thousands to a to a teenager? Is that that sort of thing? Y yeah. 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 With no breaks on being and able. To no, spend. it's not the amount. It's it's just out of control. You know, it's there's no uh, um. You know, and if they don't give it to them, say if Chelsea doesn't give them hundred grand, then they'll go to Man City who give them two hundred grand. You yeah. know, it escalates. There's no kind of person in there going actually enough or or letting rules out over under twenty fives that get their money at the end of their career. But yeah, yeah, you know, this would be a sensible kind of decision. But I, I think it, it, you know, they. They're getting huge amount of money, and I, and I don't begrudge them for getting it. But like I say, I'd, I'd wish they'd give it at the end of their career because, to be honest with you, the, the three richest men in football are agents. That tells you everything you need to know about football. So um, there's a lot of uh, um, unscrupulous characters around the younger generation. 
that's given them wrong uh, information and, and point them in different directions. And there's all those adverts out there, like we said, with the gambling and the uh, and the this. I know one guy changes his car colour every month. You know, <laughs> you know, and there's you see like Marcus Rashford doing huge amount of good with it. You know, but they're, they're the 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 minority that proves the kind of raw yeah, yeah. you know there's not many that know how to handle it or put it away i've always lived even when i was and i got the back end of the money um i always put i came down to a very basic level of living what i was comfortable with and i put every single penny away and mm-hmm. i lived it so when i retired i still was living at that level so yeah. what players yeah. usually do at a very young age, they use the money that's coming in, they go to the maximum. So every single month they're maxing out at that money and going beyond yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they're getting villas, they're getting this, they're getting cars, more and more, this, this, that, and that, bang, bang, bang. And then when they stop their career and the money stops, they go, they still want to live to that level. And it, oh, hold on, we ain't got that amount. What are we doing? You know, I think it's somewhere, correct me if I'm wrong, the line... It, pandemic schools and all sorts of um, to these statistics, but it's 50% get divorced within three years of retirement and 50% still go skint. 50% yeah. go bankrupt within three years of retirement. I mean, and that's even- tragic, really. If you think about the determination that these people have displayed throughout their careers, um, it does show that there is need for, for some work in this area. I'm going to move on, but I, I'd love to chat to you another time about that. So um, Jason uh, Fleming says, it's an honour to hear you speak and an inspiration to so many. What have you learned from your coaching managerial career so far? And what are your aspirations for the future? Um, I've worked in seven different countries in the last uh, 19 years since I retired, and uh, they've all been exploratory. But, you know, I, I, it seems like me, I'm be, my last job was, was, was a Chinese company, and, I, and I, I ran five football clubs and a basketball team and, and TV rights. I was vice president of a, of a company. And it seems like the last 10 years have taken me into the office and not actually onto the, to the training pitch as a coach. And that's the kind of stuff that I used to enjoy. But um, it seems like it's pushed me into the mental health and addictions arena. It seems like something up there, you know, and I'm following my path, you know, and it, it, it don't seem, I'm not getting the because I did play for Arsenal as well and only Arsenal it's worked a little bit against me it's like there's limited opportunities of going anywhere else and why would I go anywhere else and it's like actually I don't no disrespect but I don't want to be Rochdale manager you know I don't want to be Burnley manager I don't want to you know I, I no disrespect, but anyone can kind of be that. They can't, but anyone can. You know, it's not. We get given gifts, I believe, in life, and yes. and to fulfil myself. And I've been given a gift of sobriety. I'm coming up 25 years without a drink and a drug, and uh, actually, you know, I got an opportunity to pass this stuff on. And I think if I don't do that, and I go into the football industry or something else, I've always been kind of, and I'm not sure yet. I've got a bit of hand on heart here. As it, when you're a player, you're powerful. Mm-hmm. You've got all the control. You're on that pitch. You're heading it. You're kicking it. You're organising. You're working your stuff. You're doing the stuff. You're lifting the trophies. You're powerful. When you're a coach and a manager, you're really not powerful. You have to stand on that side and let go. And it's completely yeah. foreign to yeah. me. And I'm yeah. not sure if I actually quite like that. I, I, I can't sure I can. I like the powerlessness in that role. So it's maybe the mental health game for me for the future. But who knows? Very good. Very good. And and uh, good to leave it open. Um, now, someone called Tim uh, Grabney is asking about. Naomi Osaka's situation and how did you find dealing with the media obligations while you were playing? Did the media put uh, excessive pressure on you to perform publicly as well as on the pitch, let's say? Um, weirdly, Etta, you know, when I was drinking and, dry, uh, drinking and driving, I did that, <laughs> which was part of the illness. But when I was drinking and, and I was, when I was sick, yeah. I was doing some bad stuff. Yeah. And I had a CID outside my front door. I was front pages, front pages of the news of the world, you know, not back pages, front pages. And I was getting up to all sorts of bad stuff. 
and uh, the pressure was intense and they could never talk to me. You know, I was the last out of the dressing room. I used to run away, you know, because I was full of, full of fear. And it was just escalating, fear on fear on fear. And it was getting worse and worse and worse. Weirdly, when I surrendered and I got well, and uh, I didn't do so bad stuff to be, and I'll give you one story of how it kind of all evaporated when I got clean and sober, because I wasn't getting up to stuff. You know, I was pretty, you know, I was going to the cinema, going to the theatre, and they're like... <laughs> You know, they didn't want to report that. I became boring, you know. My two books, you know, Sober sold 400,000 copies in the first year. It's all sex, drugs and rock and roll. You know, my, my new book, I know the book game's changed a bit, but 2008, I released my second novel. It did about 20,000 copies. You know? <laughs> you know, it's all about going to the theatre and how we stay sober and love's, life's wonderful yeah. and love. And they don't want to know about that. <laughs> yeah, so it changed. But I had one incident, 18 months clean and sober, and I was still in a bit of fear of the past and, and journalism and all the kind of people that used to doorstep me. And I've, you know, I've been hacked and, and, and two, two News International and Mirror Group. Um, so I had all that kind of stuff. But I came back to my house in Putney. I was living in Putney in the time. And there was a I saw him because you, you know these things. It was a journalist. He's on my doorstep. And I'm thinking, oh, no, you know, instant panic attack again. They all came back like floods of that. What have I done? You know, because of the blackouts I used to have. But I'm clean and sober now and I've not done anything for 18 months. And you know what he was saying? He said, I've come around here to congratulate you on being awarded the, an MBE. And I went. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. You know, and you had all the response and all the stress that actually had been induced by the media in the past. That's a beautiful story. Yeah, and, so I'm uh, free today. Yeah. That's all gone. Yeah, though. and it's all about freedom, isn't it? It's about being able to live without being in high, on high alert the whole time. They say um, the only, yeah. only stick is your secrets. And I yeah. do believe that. Yeah. You know? And I cleaned house with the, with the first book, to be honest with you. Yeah. I cleaned house with that first book. Yeah. Be able to leave. There's no one. I can walk along the road now and there's no one jumping out and saying, oh, you did that. You know, you know I've got my head yeah. out right, and I'm not scared of anything. It reminds me of our chat earlier today when I said, are there any areas, you know, we, you know, show you anything you want me to ask? And you said, Etta, I'm an open book. And I thought, and what a what a wonderful way to live, you know, um, that, that's great. Now, someone's, so now we've got uh, about 50 questions and they're all pretty good. Uh, what I want to find is, yes, Sarah Deep Ashes question, at what point of life, basically they're doing my job for me, so there's all <laughs> these are things that I would have asked, but at what point of life uh, did you decide to put a break to the bohemian life? How was the path of recovery and did it make you a better person? We've covered a bit of this, but actually, uh, Tony, we haven't covered it all because I, I do I do remember you saying I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I do remember you, you know, talking uh, about, you know, the incidents, the car crash, etc. So do you want to talk a little bit about the yeah. uh, about your, you know, the lowest point, I guess? I've got some skin in the game. Yeah. <laughs> um Briefly, the, the, the year of 96, really, you know, in a nutshell, um, I put my, my, I, I was spending a lot of time in pubs and clubs. So I married a barmaid. Her drug of choice was crack cocaine. So what she did for me, she propped me up. At least I'm not as bad as you. You know, it was a very volatile. We weren't intimate. It was a, a, a destructive. We were pulling each other down. It was a horrific situation. But I put her into treatment because it's her fault and not mine. So she went. Then I, I, didn't, I got injured because I abstained from drinking when I've been playing. You know, I've been playing so I could not drink while I was playing for long periods over my 12 years of drinking. Obviously, I got a lot of success when I was playing. So I knew that. So football had to be removed as well. So I got injured. I did my cartilage. That came out. Then my three kids had to go away. You know, I passed out one Sunday afternoon after doing seven bottles of Shabli at an Indian restaurant. Passed out. My mother-in-law took the kids away. Then I gave, was given, which saved my life, and I always get a bit teary at this point, my mother-in-law gave me a, a number of a, of a counsellor, of a therapist, and um, said to me, sort this guy out. Um, <laughs> she actually said he'd run with the craze back in the day and he don't drink and drug anymore. And he's kind of, he's all right kind of guy and um, go and see him and, um, and sort your life out. You know, you're drunk and 
bugger. So I, I threw myself into the, the tournament, uh, Euros 96, white knuckled it through the tournament. But as soon as Gareth missed the penalty, I was spiraling out of control. I had an almighty six week bender. I didn't go back to work. So the manager I really let down, manager at the time is Bruce Rioch. He was, uh, um, the physio was trying to find me, but I was, I was here, there and everywhere. And obviously I, my knee was shot to bits at the Euro. So I had another operation, drink after drink after drink, getting my last three days, blackouts after blackout. I weed myself every time I got drunk, pretty much every time. Um, and uh, I can't remember where I stayed Wednesday night, but I woke up Thursday morning, went down the King's Road, actually soiled my pants, which alcoholism's not pretty. And I remember it cr getting the crust out of it, putting my jeans back on, walking down the King's Road. I must have stunk. It was just a, an almighty low of my life. And sex had stopped working as well. It's another thing that changed the way that I felt. I used to pick up girls from, uh, um, take them home from a club in uh, Swallow Street. And um, Friday morning, I'd give her the money, go away. Uh, with ego and arrogance um, and finally getting to my bottom at five o'clock, 16th of August, 1996, when if I drank brandy, this is the insanity of it. So you bring brandy. I used to spew it up. So I used to put it in my Guinness to keep it down. <laughs> so I've got a pint of Guinness with the brandy in the Guinness. Um, and I started to cry. And I was I was I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. I've drunk too much too long for too often. But you know, I was, I was at the, we call it the jumping off point and I didn't want to live anymore. You know, football was off the radar. The, the game that I loved to death, you know, the game that a six year old little boy at the start of Rackney Marshes, it wasn't on the equation. You know, it was a life or death situation. I would just, I didn't want the pain anymore. I just wanted out. I just wanted out and I had streams of tears. First time I'm 29 years of age, never cried in my life. You know, I'm streaming, 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 streaming. And I just broke. Yeah. It just broke. I just broke. I had a spiritual awakening, a moment of clarity, call it what you want. Um, I did a home detox, as it were. I went home and shook and shaked, and, um, which was quite scary all weekend. I went into work on the Monday. I didn't have a license, and my driver came round to take me into work, and I used to take him down the pub. <laughs> he said, no, come on, let's go to work. I said, go to work, see. And I bumped into someone at work who had avoided, you see, because my colleague had been clean and sober without a bet for about 18 months. And he was like, um, and just for a moment, when I was ready and when I was open, he came up to me in the, in the um, car park at the training ground. And uh, we're full of shame and guilt. And he went, join the club. He said, do you want to go to a meeting? And my journey began. And yeah. I went back to see that number that my mother-in-law had given me. And uh, I went to go back. I saw him. And that started my journey of recovery. So 25 yeah. years down yeah. the road, I still see the same therapist. And I still go to AA. You know, That's AA has sorted my addiction out. My therapy is there for all my other stuff, life's anxieties, all those fears, all those stuff, everyday things that we all go through, yeah. pandemics and stuff. I don't know if you've noticed this, this thing going on at the moment. All this kind of stuff, you know, relationships, mental health, my therapist gets that. My, and, and some people get hooked up at the terminology of therapist and stuff. He's my mate. He's my mate. He's got a few more life experiences a bit farther down the path he's a bit more wiser than me should we say that you know so I, I prefer that because yeah. you know doctor patient ooh, 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 you know so some people got hooked up get past it you know that's what my, my message is get past that I had to get past it and it's not better or worse it's just someone that's a little bit more clean and sober and without a bet than me yeah that's a beautiful way of putting it and, and so much less uh, threatening in a way for some people to to be able to come forward we're about to move on to the sporting chance bit where i really want people to hear about but susie godson of the me too move, me too movement you 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 uh, you you you'll know about it in terms of mental health and young people they're very keen to to hear about the, the sporting and young people issues but she says you talk of getting to the jump off point the rock bottom of alcoholism before beginning your recovery looking back 
in terms of prevention, uh, prevention yeah. or early intervention, could anything have stopped you uh, reaching that low point? It's a fantastic question. And I wish I had the secrets to a lot of this stuff, you know, and, um, you know, when you're full of denial, you know, my manager, my mum, my dad, they come up to me, go away. I've got this exterior up, you know, I ain't got a problem. It's him, it's her, it's him, blame, dum, dum, dum. You've got this, I can't be, I'm England captain for God's sake. I can't be an alcoholic. You know, you've got this war, I had this war up and it needed to be every bit of pain, every bit of humiliation. I had to get to the bottom, my bottom, you know, everyone's got their own. We talk about a lift going down to the bottom. You can get off any floor you want. So we try to, that's Sporting Chance, and I do personally, I try to lay everything out to the person that's struggling and so try to, because we're full of justification. You know, it's his fault, or that fault, or that. And we have minimization as well. You know, there's a lot of people at the, my industry were drinking more than me, weren't having the same effect, but I was full of judgment. Hold on a minute. You know, he's, he's a donkey. He stands at the bar. He's there, you know, all day long. You know, I, I just happened to be the one that was in Chelmsford of Prison. I was the one with blackouts. I was the one with weird myself. So it's incredibly hard. It's a fantastic question. You know, and if we had the tools, that's what we'd be doing it, wouldn't we? We'd be laying it out there. What I can say, it's all about that. Yeah. We have to talk. You know, it's been my saviour. You know, I couldn't. I suppressed everything if we can get this the more people open up the better it is the more education we have the better it is so that's all i can say i can keep saying this is what happened to me you know this is how i got through it this is what happened this is how i got through it and my life today is unbelievable i got a peaceful head i ain't got five people in my head telling me to do this this and this yeah. i've got a peaceful heart and full of contentment and love today. You know, that's a very different person to the to the lost soul that, that was out there drinking alone. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a great question. Yeah, um, so, so this makes me wonder whether there might have been commonalities, there might still be commonalities uh, that drive people towards being so good at sport, um, that drive them towards uh, being able to give everything to the sport, uh, and equally, um, uh, are uh, finding the help, let's say, via Sporting Chance Clinic, being able to be addressed for their shared commonalities, uh, mm -hmm. personality wise, or indeed experiences wise, and maybe that's where the success of Sporting Chance lies. But let me ask you just more generally, um, what made you set up Sporting Chance Clinic? You, you set it up in 2000. And, and then a little bit about who comes through, how many have been through, if you know. Tell us a bit about it. Oh, wow. <laughs> I better rush through this. <laughs> uh, it's great stuff. It's a brilliant. And, you know, it, we talk about drive and ambition and all that when we're, when we're in, 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 in the positive. And then you talk about, you know, disease and, and illness once you've crossed the line. And is a very, you know, I can be a workaholic today. I, I'm an addict at the end of the day. And I have to watch that. The minute I'm doing emails at three in the morning, I know I've crossed the line. You know, I have to rail it in. I'm about balance today. But just quickly about the sporting chance, I was getting calls from colleagues. I was about two, three years clean and sober. Uh, a lot of co colleagues, footballers uh, in particular, uh, how did you do it, Tom? What did you do? What did you do? And I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not a psychotherapist. I'm not a counselor. I've just got my, what do, what do you guys call us? A lived experience, people, haven't we? <laughs> uh, we've all got lived experience. But I was one of those that had uh, lived experience around not picking up a drink a day at a time and playing football uh, in, that, the, in that culture. So they were getting in touch. I didn't know how to get them out. So I got people and clean and sober in a particular way. You mentioned Peter, the great chef that he was. He talked the talk. He was an unbelievable talker about the disease of addiction. He was brilliant. It was fun. Um, I met a, um, another, um, Ross Harwood, who was a lawyer, who worked for the Charity Commission. Uh, I did a step four in a um, 12-step program. I went for a 12-step program, Alcoholics Anonymous 12-step program. F step four is a, a fearless and moral inventory part of that inv inventory was my book um and part of my book it raised um it was about 250 grand came down to 167 after tax something like that 
And I gave that to Sporting Chance to start, you know, about business or any business, if 50% of business is failing the first year. So we made a lot of mistakes in the early days. I put my therapist um, in a hotel, actually, where the team was training and we fell forward. You know, I got a lot of information over from the Americans. I uh, got NLP was big at the time. I got a couple of therapists that come over. Uh, I did a survey. They did a survey of the general um, rehab market, as it were, at, the, at that present time. And uh, I was thinking about foundation and putting people through the priory. Uh, then I kind of went, well, actually, we're not special and different because that just makes us sad. But there's something around what you just said, Ezra, about the, the sports person that we can identify playing in front of 30,000 people. What is that like? What's the training regime like every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, when, when you have to do that and you're absolutely knackered and you're traveling around the world? And you've got because football, you've got no mates back at home because you've been put into this bubble. So if the bubble ain't great and the experienced players are all taking down the bar, pub or into the booking office, there's going to be real issues. So I started Sporting Chance in 2000 and yet yeah, it grew and grew and grew. And we made, like, like I said, a lot of mistakes. We started with the clinic. It's materialising to four services. To be honest with you, it started with education. It started with me and Peter. And the big one was Alex Ferguson. At Man United. Alex at the very start went, come in and talk to us, Tone. And me and Peter, I always remember Peter, he brought a, a, a life side plastic dummy actually into their old training ground. And we went in there and, and Alex went, in you come, Tone. Because he had a, I think because of the drinking culture at Man United at the time, he had a real lot of guilt around helping a few of the players. He, he asked me once, he said, what can I have done differently, Tone? You know, he had a few people that were that were really struggling, a few of his um, footballers. And uh, anyway, so he went, come in and see us. So we went in there, we gave him a talk like I'm doing today for about an hour, and he gave his seal of approval. And such is the character of the game and the standing in the game, Every single football club wanted us to come in. So we got education, first and foremost, through the door. As soon as we got education through the door, you know, the PFA come on board, and that was our big one. You know, Gordon Taylor is like Marmite, I think, to a lot of people, you know, uh, but he was all over us. Absolutely, he got it, and he had a huge, obviously, there's so many. The average career for professional footballers, only six years. So there's a hell of a lot of players that are retired that have got really major issues. And they're the ones that we basically see in the clinic. And what's it's, it's evolved so far now that we've got a, a network of counsellors and it's the final kind of bit of the jigsaw. So it's education that we've always done. We've got the clinic, which we've always done. Then you've got the helpline, which we've always done. And it's materialised in 2014. We had a historic sex abuse cases in football. And Prince William, chairman of the FA, president of the FA, got a Dr Ellie, she might be on the call, Dr Ellie Anson, to get a criteria around getting a charity or an organisation that could handle the therapy, that level of therapy for the 870 cases of sex abuse, uh, in historic sex abuse cases in football. And we were chosen as, as you know, it went to tender, we were chosen. And we basically, and still today, are clearing up that and supporting adult survivors of uh, the sex abuse um, cases. So the triage was built from that. So the network of counsellors that we've got, and it's high level, it's psychiatrists like you, Etta, and stuff. It's, it's high level because this is major trauma at a young age, you know, and, and, and there's been a few convictions uh, and, and documentaries about certain people that I, I won't go into, but it was a high level level of, of care needed. And, I, and I'm very proud of all the practitioners, the psychiatrists, everyone involved in that operation and still going on operation seven years now down the road. And the chairman at the time, Greg Clark, uh, you know, and, and the, to be honest with you, Prince William, is, it was absolutely amazing with this, you know, because first guy came out in Ackley in 1996, you know, and it was Premier League, Rasmataz game, they put it under the carpet, you know, and Eddie Wood would come forward, to, you know, 20 odd years later. And finally, there was no putting it under the carpet anymore. And Prince William went, 
let's do it. And yeah. uh, like I said, I'm very proud of my organization for clearing that up. That uh, absolutely, you 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 stepped in and you and you and you really delivered there. Every day there was a new case coming through. It was an onslaught of of, of sexual abuse cases through, uh, and and uh, and of course it led the way for many other sports to be able to. Uh, to to share to share their tragedies as we know now uh, most I don't think any sport was spared uh, male and and females you know in training environments so so that was a, a really incredible piece of work Tony we've got now fifty questions and only a few minutes left so I'm going to take a few, I'm gonna uh, we uh, well I, I think everything you say is just generating more more interest so I want to ask you um, there are there's something about cricket uh, we've spoken about football but as um, as we know, uh, cricket uh, has um, reached out for mental health input. Uh, I, and this is a question from Amit Anan. Um, you have secured contract with many organizations, including the PCA. I wonder whether you get referrals from the PCA and, and maybe um, uh, just tell us a little bit about anything you know about cricket and mental health. Well, I, that was my last before I, I set up my new company and I'm, I'm doing the same um, services now for, for companies because I, I think the big businesses that have got big turnovers, uh, they need to take some strain off the NHS and, and look after their employees. And a lot of big businesses, they want mental health, but they, they talk mental health, they want mental health, but they don't want to pay for it. And I think, no, come on now, guys, you, you know, you're making big, huge profits. You look after your, your employees. Anyway, I'll wheel it back. Where were we? What was he talking about? <laughs> um, uh, well, just, yeah, uh, uh, sorry, I've just read, someone is saying, give the man a knighthood. People have been <laughs> rewarded for violence and someone else is agreeing. So there you are. I, I fully agree with that you absolutely deserve that and 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 uh, just one just just going back to the cricket before i go on to yeah, cricket. That's uh, what uh, um have the do so do you have a lot of cricketers coming through and are they manifesting similar distress around similar issues okay yeah thank you for reminding me uh cricket um uh, well, it was the last thing I did before I, I stepped back and started my new company. That's what I was saying. Uh, I did the PCA, which is the PCT um, contract. We were given that contract 2018. Um, I went round. I was actually the lead education. I did the lead education. I did 18 cricket clubs um, from Essex to, to Gloucestershire. I went in and we talked mental health and addiction. Um and we obviously on the back of that got referrals and there's some great work being done by the network of counsellors. I did notice I did the women's as well, which was really fascinating. And it might be just appropriate for a couple of minutes um, that they were world champions in 2017. And they just went from from zero to hero overnight. And a lot of them um, were young um single <laughs> young girls that were all of a sudden two million followers on on instagram and they just didn't know what to, they always put into loughborough university and they had to be professional and they've gone from having a great game of cricket <laughs> you know knocking the ball about and having some fun to actually hold on a minute overnight you've got to be professional you've got to do this you can't do this you can't take recreational drugs you can't do drink you know you have to be professional and it hit them like a wall you know it did really hit them so like we got a couple of referrals from 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 that episode but it's all about the education you all have to remind and i and i talk very similar about the rfl contract that i started in 2012 um Within, we do a, a survey every year. We go back in and say, look, do you know who we are? Do you know what we do? And do you know how to get in contact with us? And it's really simple, three questions. And in the course of three to five years of regular education, we got a 99% feedback from the RFL in 2017, mm -hmm. saying they knew who we were, they knew how to get in touch, they knew how to, everything. The three questions, yes, 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 99%. And we got the adult population, which was passing it down to the new recruits. So you get it through the generation. So we now just go in there, you know, 
once once every other year just a reminders because they're passing it down you know and then you get some through treatment and then the tr ones in treatment get well and they go back into the community and we've had a lot of success in cricket there's a couple of guys and i know you've worked with one that we we won't mention names you know done some great work with these people and they're the next you know generations to be passing it on so yeah we get at the moment jockeys are the ones that are um, mm. we're encountering the most uh, there's been a, two suicides and, and uh, a lot of issues, but we've got some amazing successes as well. Mm -hmm. um, and the game's really, um, a guy called there, Paul Shrubbers, he's really, um, you know, yeah. fighting for it now and, uh, and, 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 you know, throwing everything into education and, uh, and supporting their mental health. Because it's a lonely industry. That's a, and I always think cricket, to be honest with you, Etta, is the, it's a one game. It's like an individual game. It's not a team game. You know, it's an individual game within a team game. You're either batting or you're bowling. It's I couldn't do it. At least I've got my mates around me when I'm playing football. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At least yeah. I can blame someone. <laughs> to take uh, now, the um, chair's prerogative. I've got a question for you as an addiction psychiatrist that I am. Uh, are you able, looking back on your career, at sporting chance to say that some sports favor some particular addictions you may not be able to and there may be not any science behind it but just out of interest I did, no it, uh, you're right I've, I've only through my experience etta you know i'm not like you know i'm not a professional and i leave it to the professionals but just my experience of the last 21 years you know and i said very early on that the premier league footballers it's all about the gambling now you know the premier league lower leagues rugby there's a prescribed drugs, which is which is quite uh, interesting. Tramadol, painkillers, these type of because you're getting it from your your coat, what wouldn't it, your your doctor in the club, your kind of club physio. You think it's okay, you know, so prescribed drugs and booze. Uh, jockeys are coke, a lot of cocaine use, uh, weight loss. Um, they use it for coke. So there, there is certain kind of substances. I call them all milkshakes, to be honest. <laughs> I said a lot of them like chocolate, yeah. but, but they're all addicts. There's yeah. all I'm talking about people that have crossed the line, not people that are um, take it or leave it, or they're you know once in a done it when they were 16 at school and never touched it again. You know, I'm not talking about them. Talk. I'm talking about the people like me yeah. that used to go to oblivion. Yeah. You know, so there is a difference in the sports. Mm -hmm. There is in cricket also, you know, the huge depression, anxiety, yeah. fears, yeah. lots of time on your own. It's very lonely industry. You know, football, you have got a group of players, you know, you can spot them. You can spot them, you know, and, uh, you know, cricket's, uh, yeah, I think we all get, and, and it's never on its own. It's, uh, in, in my experience as well, you just don't get one thing, you know, one gambling, it's just gambling. I'm doing, you know, without any fear or depression or anxiety or drink, or, it just doesn't. Fully agree. Fully, fully agree. Very good point. I'm glad you raised this. Now, I'm going to ask you two more things before we finish. First of all, um, a question, a very good question from Roy Gurprashad, who says, what a privilege to hear you speak, Tony, you speak so candidly. Uh, what are your thoughts on sports related dementia? Hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm part of the heading study, which is, uh, um, you know, and, and I, I think you're, um, We've still got to do the research. The research is still coming in, at you know, and it's really difficult to, I did fall down the stairs, you know, I had alcohol abuse, you know, and I had car crashes and I, and I did a lot of heading of the ball as well. And what's going to cause the dementia? Uh, I, I'm not too sure, you know, and to actually put my kind of age group, I and mean, it's my age group that they're looking at, um, and actually define that it's got a direct correlation. The research is still being done by the professionals, and I'll wait for that. But just my personal ideas around, actually, I don't have to add 200 balls like we used to. The balls change. You know, you can train people with balloons. So if there's a kind of person which the FA are putting in and the PFA into every club or to go around every club and saying the pr best practice, best practice in all the clubs going forward. You don't have to smack and egg balls all the time. And the concussion rule is very good in the football. You've got instant, you know, I remember being sick on the coach and uh, on, on the side of the pitch and going back onto the, on playing again, you know? So I'll shut up quick. You've got one more question. 
<laughs> right. Well, uh, no, very good, very good. I'm going to say, so uh, just before I ask you my last question, um, Peter Carter, lovely Peter Carter saying, thank you, Tony and Henrietta for so much, uh, so much for this evening. We could have had a few more hours and I really couldn't agree more. I could sit here all night and listen. But listen, I'm going to finish with a question. Actually, I was chatting to my husband, who's also an addiction psychiatrist, and I was telling him I was about to speak to you. And I said, come on, one question from you, Owen. And he said, <laughs> what do you feel your true legacy will have been? Football or sporting chance? And I thought, wow, that's a good question coming up. I'll go back to my very first point. You know, there's nothing like leading your country out for you know England football Arsenal but Etta you know I've had an opportunity to help people and um I'm gonna get teary I'm gonna get teary Etta I'm gonna go so am I so am I Tony I'm already teary <laughs> yeah know, I, I've got you know numerous pals around me now friends that are clean and sober because I'm clean and sober. Yeah. And my daughter, I'll leave you with this. My daughter, who's 11, my, I've got six and my youngest is 11. And she said to me the other day in the car, she said, Dad, I'm 11 years sober. Did you know that? And it kind of just rubs off, you know, it rubs off in the family. And I've got a, I've got a circuit breaker in my family. You know, I'd be able to not pass it on. You know, my mum and dad were addicts. My granddad was a raving alcoholic. You know, it's in the family genes as well. There's DNA in there for sure as well. You yeah, know, and I've kind of gone bang. I've kind of gone bang and I've stopped it. Stopped it. I've stopped yeah. it. And my kids will never experience that bottom. Yeah. Absolutely. And, 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 and on that note, Tony, can I just say what an honour and privilege it's been to, 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 to be, you know, by your side for those years and to, and to see you put everything you've got into this, into this recovery and to the well-being of others around you. So before I get teary, stay <laughs> there and I'm just going to do my last bit. Um, so uh, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to talk about the RSM for a moment, the fact that it is an educational uh, establishment uh, amongst many other things, that these webinars are free and they are for everyone who wants to learn from people who've changed the world, changed the country in one way or another. But do feel free to, if you've enjoyed tonight, to donate to us. Uh, there's a QR code uh, or when you signed up, you'll see there are lots of ways in which you can contribute and we really welcome your donation so we can continue with the educational purposes um, of these evenings amongst many, many other things that we do to give you a taste of the next two things that we're doing next Wednesday our president Roger Kirby will be interviewing uh, Professor Dame Carol Black and this will be a real highlight of the year same time Wednesday night and then on June the 8th our health emergency of climate change series will look at the impact of mental health and this will be with Dr. Lisa Page, Ashley Consolo, and chaired by our wonderful president of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, Adrian James. So on that note, thank you again, Tony. I'm so sorry I can't have dinner with you because we're on Zoom, but we'll make up for it in the future. Thank you to the um, uh, to, to people who are helping us, Sean in particular with the tech side here at the RSM, and thank you for Tanya for helping tonight with the Q&A. Good night, everyone. <laughs>